Hey friends, it's Melvin. Thanks for tuning into this episode. Here's just a few quick things I wanted to notify you guys about before we get started. First up, very soon, new episodes will be releasing Wednesday mornings rather than Tuesday. So don't panic if you don't see a new episode on Tuesday. Just wait a little longer and you'll see it in your feed. Second, we've introduced a mailbag. Check those show notes and toward the bottom you'll see a mailbag link. You'll then be able to text us any questions you might have about movies, the movie industry, or any movie slash Christian related questions you might have. Then we'll respond in a future episode, so send us your questions now. Up next, Patreon polls, which are available to Patreon supporters at the $3 tier or higher, have been updated. Supporters can now suggest films or shows to be reviewed at the end of each month. The two most liked submissions will become the options for the Patreon poll, so if you want to hear us talk about your favorite movie or show, join our Patreon and start campaigning. And lastly, whether you're a new or long-time listener, please consider writing a review or rating the Cinematic Doctrine podcast on iTunes and Spotify. Apart from financially supporting on Patreon, these are the two most helpful ways to support the show. And that's it. Enjoy the episode. This episode is part two of our Best and Worst of 2022 series. Be sure to tune into the previous episode for additional content. Also, support on Patreon for $3 a month and gain access to several uncut episodes, including this one, which includes an additional 10 reviews of honorable mentions. That's a whopping 30 movies from 2022 discussed in just this little series. Anyways, here's the episode. So we're going to ni- number uh, 96 on the bad side. This one might be a controversial negative for me, um, but my 96th on the list, so this is now now officially in my bottom five. Sorry. That's why I was so confused. We are at The Whale. Um, this was a very big movie at the beginning of the year uh, because there were no big movies yet, and then can happened, and... This one was being well regarded. This is Darren Aronofsky's latest movie featuring um, Brandon Frazier in a very big suit in which he is a character who is stuck at home. It's a week in the life of this guy who's trying to reconnect reconnect with his daughter. Look, it's very well performed. Its soundtrack is good. It's very well shot. And the body effects are very good. But the movie is one of the most anti-religious like religious and very pointedly anti-Christian movies I've ever seen is the first time I ever left a movie spiritually wounded where I felt like I was kind of not like me like I get it when people deny Christ they're not denying me they're denying Christ so it's fine like I I can endure that because it's not about me but there was something so really upsetting about that and there's even this monologue about how a character doesn't like the, the narrative the story of Moby Dick you know, it talks about how, like, it's a thing about nothing, and this person's pursuing something, whatever. And, like, it really is pointedly a metaphor for the Bible at all, like, in its entirety. Um, and th- there's representation of Christianity in the movie, and it's very um, juvenile. It's, it's genuinely a juvenile. Uh, like, it's actually a young person. And, like, the things they do are things that mature Christians would say, like, aren't wise to do or say. And so, like, the antagonistic force of Christianity as represented in it isn't even represented in, in like, a way that makes sense. It just, it was really problematic. I think it's well made, but it's still a one out of ten to me just because I, I think, like, just so much being put into that to just say, like, I don't know, to just be so like, to, to just hate God, the one who loves me and the one that I love. It just, it was so, so wrong. Uh, and so to me, yeah, a hardcore no for me. So yeah, I said the three, five, five was in my bottom five. That was incorrect because 96 to 100 is five. So the whale starts out our real bad ones with it being number 95. Now you have seen other Aronofsky projects. I have not um really can you speak to that i don't know i, I which don't... aspect of it just just um i i remember you were saying that like um aronofsky kind of in his latest projects has been more overt about his he, about he spirituality has, i know yeah, mother he's... is very pointedly um a very wild criticism of christianity from a naturist point of view he but... seems to be airing all his dirty laundry with 
specifically theistic religions and particularly obviously with uh with the emphasis on the judeo-christian understanding of god um when he in noah he uses elements of kabbalah and jewish mysticism to sort of fill out the plot because like the story of noah is relatively short short story two chapters barely so um which so i understand he's filling in some of the narrative gaps with other material um, but yeah, Aronofsky has always had like this like spiritual it, like um, Pi is about Kabbalah, um, the fountain. While lo- lo- logically doesn't make any sort of sense, it is a very s- spiritual film and its understanding of love, conquering time and death and all that stuff. Um, I like Aronofsky's films. I, I I would say overall I've enjoyed every single one I've watched, even a movie like mother, which is very polarizing. I can't say I didn't enjoy watching it. It's, it's a really wild movie. Um, but you know, black Swan is a movie. I really, really like a lot. And the wrestler is just a tremendous movie. And every wrestling fan loves the wrestler for a variety of reasons, but it really is a, a, a wonderful story about a very broken, sad human being. Uh, it's definitely all of his movies are not for everyone. I'll, I'll just say on the front, like they're all, they all have things about them that will really, put different people off black swan is very disturbing and um the wrestler is a very hard film to 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 watch in some respects as well and the fountain just doesn't make any sort of sense (laughs) just to be honest with you um and mother is extremely polarizing for obvious reasons as is noah and so noah is really the beginning of him making movies that specifically make christians upset um in the movie noah at one point is so overtaken with anguish that he tries to murder his own family um (laughs) which some of you may recall does Uh, not happen in the bible (laughs) um and it the it's and it's like the god in the movie noah is not you know it's not it's not our understanding of god it's he's referred to as just the creator they never call him god or yahweh um god is very distant he which i don't know if narratively they were in biblical time i don't think they would i don't think uh god Someone, hadn't revealed his name yeah someone pointed that, that out to me actually at the, watching it but like more just like the way characters talk saying. about yes. yeah the the god it seems almost not personal yeah of which he not, probably was seem- at that point i mean there were proto-evangelia revelations uh in which God is sitting with people at that time. So, yeah. And so like Noah is tr- constantly trying to uh, ascertain what God wants him to do. And eventually <laughs> he tr- tries to kill Emma Watson, and, and, <laughs> you know? Um, and so that kind of thing is just very off putting and, and his, his implication that part of why God destroys humanity is because they're not, they're eating animals and eating meat. <laughs> it's probably not uh, on the money either. And the Nephilim are there killing people, which is awesome. So, so, you know, I can't, can't talk in points for that. Uh, and, and then, but this continues through, through mother and um, now I guess in the whale. So I don't know what his beef <laughs> with Christianity is. Uh, I don't know if he's specifically responding to criticisms of his movies, but. His, his yeah. beef, at least here seems, I, I wrote a pretty a seriously lengthy letterbox review on this, but the film itself, the beef seems to be on like Christianity of like 30 years ago, which makes sense. He's an adult. <laughs> Like he's an older guy, so he's going to write based on his experience. Yeah. Um, But it just makes it really, like it it dates it uh, in terms of spiritual criticism, uh, in my opinion. And I get, like, I get it, right? Like, Stranger Things is big because people who are growing up in the '80s are now adults, and then their kids are liking it because '80s fashion is cool, so on and so forth. Um, But like, the whale just came off as uh, misguided, um, and so whatever. Yeah, I have not seen the whale. Um, but with something like Noah or a mother, like even if you find its contents repugnant, right? But like it feels like it's those feel like coherent statements where he's like working through his feelings and what he does and does not like about Christianity or general like theistic views of of theology, you know. And so like with mother, like while well, I came away being like, well, I'm not, <laughs> this certainly is something. Um, like I felt like, okay, like I understand what he's trying to say. Like I understand how, like how he views humanity. Like you definitely get a view of Aronofsky's view of people throughout all of his movies, which is generally seems to be not very positive. Um, he seems to love quirky weirdos who are trying to find their place in the world. That's what rest the wrestlers about. 
He loves people who are obsessive, um, which also the wrestlers about, but also Black Swan's about. Um, and he views the rest of the world as seemingly against them. Um, the world is against Noah. The world is against Randy the Ram. The world is against Natalie Portman, though she's kind of falling into her own madness. I mean, the world seems to be against Brendan Fraser's character in the well, from what I gathered, you know? And so, like, um, I don't know why he's so pessimistic. It's interesting because you've listened to interviews with Aronofsky. He hasn't come off very negative. Like, he seems like a really, honestly, kind of funny guy who, um, and he's repeatedly also been attached to different comic book properties. Like, he's going to make a Batman movie and a Wolverine movie at some point. Um, So, like, I don't know. Like, that doesn't strike, he doesn't strike me as somebody who's just, like, filled with hate and rage all the time but well so it's it's not a the movie itself isn't hateful um the movie it's it comes across like a movie that hates god and loves humans it's very humanistic and without just turning this into a the whale review where then now we have to extrapolate biblical theology stuff and explaining how that is incompatible um it just it's a movie that yeah it's it it really is. It's just check it out. Let me know what you think. Uh, but it, <laughs> okay. it's very much it. It's very pointedly, simultaneously positive hum- about humanity, and then also very, very critical of Christianity in a way that's that's more overt than something like I'm sure Noah I could watch and just be like, well, that was something, and then be done. And like at least I got to see some cool stuff. But, I kind of like Noah. Like you know, I was, was said, meh. Yeah, I like. I liked. I have enjoyed every Aronofsky movie I've watched, and. I think I think there is some there 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 are merits to Noah, um, though it's not a biblically accurate depiction of the story. Um, there's things there's things in Noah that I really enjoy. Like there's a whole creation sequence where I like Noah's telling the story of you know Genesis one one, um, and parallel to that, Aronofsky is visualizing the story with obviously his own spin on it, um, and so there's like some really neat stuff in there and. I don't know. There's like some very striking moments. Like there's a scene where Noah is just sitting on the boat and he can hear the people outside crying to be let on the boat and they're dying. And his family's like, can't we let them in? And he like, he can't, you know, and the, the camera just slowly zooms in on his face as he's hearing people cry for help and like stuff like that's like really striking. And I'm like, man, like this is, this is why you kind of want to see a biblical story put on the big screen, like be able to like really capture these moments. You may not know this, but the easiest way you can show your support for Cinematic Doctrine is to rate and review the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen. So press pause and share your thoughts. We'd love to hear what you have to say. And then press play again so you can hear the rest of the show. Um, so number five, we're getting to the good stuff on the top list. I have, uh, and I will, I guess, explain this a little bit, but I have RRR. Uh, which was the big uh, kind of out of nowhere movie at the beginning of the Surprise year. Surprise hit of the year. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's this uh, Telugu flick um, that uh, had a pretty small release in the West early in the year. And then as it continued to garner buzz, it was getting very popular. I basically woke up one morning, saw it was being talked about on Letterboxd, went to my wife and said, you want to see this tonight? She goes, not really. I get tickets and go, well, it's three hours and it starts at 930 and I don't want to go alone. <laughs> and she goes, I don't really want to, but okay. And then I get tickets and then we go and we both had like the best night of our lives <laughs> watching this crazy movie. Um, basically, one character is from a small tribe um, and at the tribe, this one child is accidentally, because they don't speak the same language, is accidentally sold off to English um colonizers um and so he is now going to leave as their hero to go get this child back then there's this other hero who is a well i guess he's a traitor he's a traitor who is now working for the english he's a english he works for the english military he's a native um uh, working for the english military and his goal is to reach the top basically the top of the tower kind of thing he's looking up at the kingdom he wants to grow up in the ranks of the military and so the two are at odds because the, the um as the military he is uh high he is told to prevent this guy from stealing this child back who has been quote unquote rightfully sold to the englishman 
and then the other hero is trying to save the child. The two interact with each other, not knowing who each other's are, and they become best friends. What will happen is what the lyrics say, because it is very pointed with its lyrics about friendship. It's, it is a blast to watch. Um, it is wonderful. Uh, it is very much made in the Bollywood Telugu Indian way. So it's got the editing style of exactly what you're thinking of if you've seen funny clips. So you'll have to get through that. And if you combine to that, you're going to have a blast. It has the big thing about this movie that was talked about is like, this is a movie very much saying like, what are some crazy cool things we can do with the cool talents that our actors have? And it would be like acrobatics and stuff like that. And we'll build action sequences and crazy stuff around that. And uh, in a world that is saturated by CG and Mandalorian CG domes and um, just like like Idris Elba turning into a CG model to fight a lion instead of actually being awesome and just fighting a real lion. Um, like, which is what <laughs> yeah, I expect. Yeah, Idris Elba, come on. <laughs> um, yeah, didn't you see Roar? Come on. <laughs> um, which I watched last year. It's great. Um, crazy movie. But uh, RRR, which actually has CG animals. All the animals are CG. But uh, all the actors are not, and they actually do the things they do, and the movie is crazy. So check it out. I'm pretty sure last I saw was on Netflix. Um, this movie, tons of fun. Now, I do recognize I am coming as a Westerner who doesn't know anything about the politics or the things going on here. Um, I I have heard that the film very poorly represents the Islamic culture uh, of India, um, as a Christian, I'm not saying anything about the religion. I am only coming at this talking about specifically, like in terms of how racially they are treating one another. I, I am led to believe that the way that they treat Islam, uh, Islamic practice practicers, um, is not good. And so the movie is in a way very propagandist in that at the end, during the credits, they show a bunch of historical figures that were effective in, in changing the country. Um, and they don't show any single one that has any Islamic background, but they show the ones that have Hindu backgrounds and other backgrounds. And so, um, that is there. Uh, I don't see it. Uh, and part of that is, uh, ignorance and also like uh, obvious ignorance. Cause I grew up here, but also, um, how would I know? Um, so just understand that. I mean, that's kind of something we'd like to try to talk about on the podcast anyway, when we talk about themes and we talk about stuff, we kind of were just talking about it with the whale and Christianity. So except for RRR for me, I, you know, I like the movie. So I had that on top. It sounds like you had not seen RRR, correct? No. Yeah, okay. um, yeah, it's pretty good. I was just uh, not able to go. I kept seeing such, not just like positive things, just like people saying, this is the best time I've had the movies in forever. This is movies. Awesome. You have to see it. It was my number and, one movie for about a day. And we'll get to why in, in a couple of years. Yeah, and I was just yeah, like, but, oh man, I got I gotta see that. <laughs> like I really gotta see that. And it just it just didn't happen. I don't know. I, I I really I really feel like it must out. So it'll still be good when you finally see it. Um okay, so on to the other side. And uh we're at Jurassic World Dominion for ninety seven. Uh this is in my number four worst film. <laughs> I despised <laughs> Jurassic World Dominion. I always talk about my experience at theaters, and if I have a unique experience, it's a positive. This is one of the first times where it's a negative, where I had never been so anxious, bored, frustrated, tired. I had never been so eager to leave. I almost left the theater. I almost never do. Um, that has a close relation to another movie on these lists. I'll let you figure that out when I, well, when I guess I tell you. But, um, this uh this movie challenged me in ways that I never want to be challenged ever again. Um it sucked. It was so long, it was so boring, it was confusing. In our episode where you and I talked about it, I remember uh, I specifically said there was a time when I was lost and I asked my wife what <laughs> happened and she goes what? And I was like I don't know. <laughs> and so it's just this I it sucks. It's really really bad. I don't know how Colin Trevorrow keeps getting away with it. But I want him to keep making movies because if he makes a good one, that's actually really awesome. And I I want that for him. But if he keeps making bad ones, there's also something about it that's kind of fascinating. I never want to watch this movie again, but I guess in a way I'm kind of happy I saw it anyway because of this experience. But this sucked. Number four worst movie. 
I could not believe my eyes. I specifically texted Dan not to see it. He saw it anyway. He like texted <laughs> me back, I'm seeing it. And I was like, no. And so we just decided we'd do an episode anyway. All these movies you keep trying to get me to see. And then it's just like, uh, uh, I know. Uh, and it's bad. two hours and 40 some minutes. It's and there's bad. cut content on the cutting room floor. It's just, it is bad. I, I, it's so bad. I, had not seen a movie where characters were actors were so bored and disinterested since the rise of Skywalker. And it, it's just, it, it's insane. Every, everyone it's insane. involved deserves better, including Trevor. Rowe. Like it just, it yes. seemed like a project that um, just had to exist and like nothing anyone could have done could have stopped it from existing. And so all the actors, everyone behind the camera, and, even the title's wrong. Even the title yeah, is yeah. wrong. Why isn't it Jurassic world domination? I don't know. Cause the, uh, the dinosaurs are taking dominion of the earth, I guess. Anyway, but you don't have to explain that. You could just say world <laughs> domination. Well, why? Because we, world domination, see less words. It's less words. Uh, oh, well, we have an episode about it. So, yeah. Enjoying this episode? Grab that share link and tell your friends. Word of mouth is the most effective way for a podcast to reach new listeners, so don't be shy. Share the episode wherever you can. Okay, so number four on the good list is All Quiet on the Restroom Front, the Netflix remake. Um, Well, not remake. I guess it's just another adaption. And and you could say an actual adaption because it's an entirely, I believe it's an entirely German produced production of a German source material. Um, this movie has been challenging in its own right, apart from the fact that it's so graphic and violent and very dour, um, with one of the most brutal tone setting openings, um, ever where basically a soldier is in a, in a foxhole, you know, he's basically going to die and is sent over to run over and you see his name on his, um, on his coat and then he dies. And then we cut to like a, a field and there's some trucks driving down and then the trucks stop at like a depot. And then these um bloody clothes or bodies are put into somewhere and they're they're taken uh made bare so that the clothes can come off the clothes are then washed into giant pools of water and then the clothes are taken out in which a giant room of hundreds of women can sew the holes that are bullet holes on it and then the clothing is then given to the next soldier uh to wear because the german uh, uh germans are running out of uniforms so they have to come up with new ones um and uh the music is booming and devastating. It is mostly organic. And then they have some industrial sounds to come in to really assert the sense that like that something's wrong. This isn't right. This violence is incorrect. It's otherworldly. And yet the whole movie, you recognize that it's not. This is exactly human nature. The human nature is the, who is the one that caused this humanity. Nothing else causes this devastation of the earth and of people. Constantly throughout the film, soldiers are covered in mud. Um, and dirt and they're dusty uh i was perpetually thinking of um from dust you came from dust you'll return uh the sense in which like uh there's a combination of treating one another so horribly through violence and also treating the earth of which you came from as well from dust and so there, it's just a, a movie where i think as a christian it will constantly be on your mind biblical themes of hum- of who humanity is before god and before each other um i don't know if i'll ever watch it again i also think one particular death scene a very important one is so poorly edited so terribly edited i do not know how it happened i could not believe my eyes that this is how they edited it uh it was terrible but otherwise um i just think in general this is one of those movies similar to how i talked about with avatar 2 but I think this is one of those movies where every aspect of the film was really in conjunction with each other to make a great film um, where from set design to the uh, production to the character uh, outfits and uh, uh, hair and makeup direction acting it is a spectacle of a film um, and uh, yeah I I really I it, it's just it's good it's really good check it out I I recognize that for a lot of people it was a surprise to get so many nominations even for the academy it seems it was a surprise that it got so many nominations but if you watch it if you dare to because it is very rough um it is uh it'll make complete sense once you finish it you'll completely understand why so yeah this one's great uh Dan are you have you watched this one or did you check out at least the original I've never seen the original but I feel like maybe I don't know. Do you I, watch I, a lot of classic Hollywood? I don't know. I, I, I've seen a lot of war films. Um, okay. I have seen 
the original uh, a long long time ago okay yeah i have um, not i have not but i which is partially why i did not watch the one that came out on netflix but i am very curious to see it now i i'm, I'm definitely more interested now and it's got all the nominations but mm-hmm. yeah it's it is some stellar stuff uh okay so number 98 so this is the top three bad movies now is um one that nobody knows of at all because Letterbox tells me they always have this one section, most obscure film. It's basically something you watch that like nobody else has watched. Um, it's called A Wonderful Time of the Year. Um, this is directed by B. Harrison Smith. The reason I watch this is because he also directed Where the Scary Things Are, a movie that came out of nowhere for me and I thought was so ridiculous and so poorly made and so funny that I was like, well, I want to see if this guy has another one and you know what he had this movie called a wonderful time of the year that came out the same year um and so i checked it out nope it's a dud it's very boring um very nonsensical very ridiculous virtually no purpose it's just a family christmas movie where the family comes in nobody really seems to enjoy each other get along and uh that's it i i i virtually remember nothing from this movie um it is very very boring unlike where the scary things are where i almost remember everything because it was so ridiculous and funny and entertaining to me this one is like in one ear out the other um i didn't even have time to forget it it was that like forgettable so nothing nothing to say about that um my number three for good of the year uh for good good side uh top 10 of the year is skinnamarink uh which came out of absolutely nowhere for me um and uh, I have started by talking about these, but Dan, have have you seen Skin of Marink? And what did you think? He said knowingly. He um, says knowingly. I saw it. I really, I really liked it. Um, I know it's definitely again one of those movies that really just is not for everyone. Um, no, 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 no. But um, we are going to record an episode for it at some point. So yes so i'll keep this in brief but for me it's one of my top three of the year um this when i say challenging this movie is the absolute hardest challenge i've had at the movie theater um like jurassic world dominion i was bored i was anxious i was frustrated um i at one point picked up popcorn to eat to have something to do um my feet were jumping up and down like like a jitter foot jitter jitter yeah jitter leg um and uh but also my shoulders were raised and my eyes were constantly wide and my mouth, my, my teeth were grinding because I was also anxious with fear. It is the first time I was genuinely terrified. I saw this in theaters um, and uh, I had never, I've never been so terrified and affected by a movie since probably I was a kid watching like my first horror movie at a friend's house when I wasn't supposed to. So I not only was scared of the movie, but also scared my parents would find out. So it's like, like this, this was surreal. Um, Skin of Marink. So two kids wake up in their house and the doors and the windows of their house are disappearing and reappearing and disappearing and reappearing. And also their parents are gone. And so they go downstairs to watch TV. What could happen next? This movie is extremely weirdly shot. Um, it is mostly ceilings and carpet and you never see anybody's face ever, uh, pretty much. And it's, it's bizarre. It is very challenging because it's an hour and 40 minutes of, flickering lights and television noises and a whole lot of suggestion, but never anything very clear. The closest you'll get to a house of leaves movie adaption, the closest you'll get to a backrooms thing, the closest you'll get to seeing a nightmare on television. Um, it was crazy to see this in theaters, uh, more half pack theater, a very, very full theater that was totally engaged. Um, a f- very effective and evocative. The theater was freaked out the second the movie ended and the lights turned on because the, there's really no credits it's all in the beginning everyone was talking about the movie uh and it was like it was palpable i was so anxious after the movie i took some anxiety medicine i was really messed up by this movie and for three days my sleep was affected um i've just never felt this before where i was both eating popcorn because i was bored and also freaked out uh yeah skin of rank number three I've rewatched it since. Still good. Very good. I really enjoyed it. So, yeah, this this movie's wicked. Hey there, listener. Want to influence the podcast? 
head on over to patreon.com forward slash cinematic doctrine and support the show for three dollars a month in doing so you'll be able to vote on a movie poll that picks a film we discuss each month so jump on over there and have your voice heard Okay, so number two for Bad of the Year is The Bubble, Judd Apatow. This is Netflix. Very, 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 very bad movie, uh, but not the worst of the year. Um, This movie is basically a bunch of characters are trying to make a movie, then the pandemic happens. So they go off uh, to try to shoot this movie in another place. The pandemic happens in there. So they get stuck, and they're going to make their movie in a bubble. Uh, The movie they're making is not funny, and the movie itself that they are in is not funny um a lot of criticism for this movie is essentially like we're just watching like what a bunch of like 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 the big criticism during covid was uh, one of them was that you had a lot of rich people putting out videos saying like we care and you matter and then you have the infamous uh imagine video and you just constantly could see how rich and and well prepared people were because of how much money they had to have these opulent homes and wonderful places to be in, and they're totally fine, and they could work out in the gym, and they can do this and this and all that. The bubble felt very much like that, where like it was just that, but a movie and not funny. I think the only joke that I laughed at is at some point, oh, uh, uh, Pedro Pascal like gets sick from like drugs or something and he's like throwing up into a toilet and he asks somebody to hold his hair back and then they just panic and go you don't have any hair or something like that i don't know why that got me laugh i think my body was just desperate but it was just it was very very miserable and unfunny it was like anti-funny so i despised watching it uh so no bueno big no bueno on that i don't know if you've been watching a lot of recent judd apatow projects but i feel like i've i've read because i have not uh, not watched. since his uh, stand-up special that's the last thing of his i saw but i've i feel like i've read that he in particular has not been making stuff that's been particularly good although i heard i guess king of staten island i heard was kind of mid it was like okay i heard that was good yeah i didn't know that i didn't know that was him i didn't know that was him. yeah he directed it but it's not really a comedy it's more of a like well it's like it's like a comedy but i, I don't know anyways number two of the year this is the movie that a day later beat out rrr um and it's uh, everything, everywhere, all at once. This was my number one of the year for months. Um, and uh, it's great. It's super, super excellent. It's very well made, extremely well directed. It is like Avatar 2 being a film that's like a bunch of nothing that somebody is able to balance and make into something consumable. Everything, everywhere is very much that, except taken with like more identities and more absurdity. Um, my wife is a, is a fan of... Um, uh, uh, what is the author? He wrote Slaughterhouse Five. Kurt Vonnegut. Yeah, Kurt Vonnegut. She said it's very much in the vein of a Kurt Vonnegut science fiction in which they take a science fiction idea, which in the case of Everything Everywhere is the multiverse, and then somehow correlate it to the human condition and do it in the most absurd, crazy ways, and make sure you still have fun doing it. I have, I saw this movie in a completely packed theater, um, and it was constant laughter constant tears i had never been so wet from tears in my life other than the times that i was actually really sad other than those times from a movie um and i was like i i remember the sweater i was wearing and how soaked it was uh because i kept like wiping away tears because i couldn't see the movie anymore at times um and then i would be laughing and it would make me cry because it was so funny um it was just such a moving wonderful experience i have specifically heard though that there are older people that hate this movie and it's almost always people over the age of 40 i'm not knocking boomers i'm not knocking for which i know 40 year olds is not boomers but you know what i'm saying i'm not knocking them like this movie is made for the internet age it is chaotic it is weird it is made for people who see like weird cryptids and then right above it says me when I want McDonald's at 3 a.m. Like it is if you laughed at that kind of meme because you feel like a cryptid at 3 a.m. wanting McDonald's, then you'll get this movie. You'll connect with that it. might be the worst endorsement <laughs> I, of everything. Uh, <laughs> then you will probably be on the boomer side that does not like the movie because that is no, you, the movie. It, th- it's, that's definitely the type of thing I laugh at. But I've been... <laughs> But that's like, what I'm saying. If like, you like this meme, you will like this Academy Award nominated movie. But that's that's um, that's why it's so weird that it's getting Academy nominated is because I feel like the Academy is just a bunch of oldies, but like and like a couple youngies. So onto the worst movie of the year, 
Um, Dan, you of course are familiar with this. We did an episode on it. Um, it has not changed. It is Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I hated this movie. Really? That's surprising. I would. Yes, I, I hated. I thing. hated Texas Chainsaw Massacre. It hurt me. I did not. I found the violence too grotesque for me um and in not in the sense that like because i've seen crazier violence than texas chainsaw has but the surrounding context of it and just the effect that it like the just what it was to me seemed so nasty and unkind especially when i feel like the first movie is so like the the original uh is so uh i don't know just uh, it's so conscientious of humanity ironically to to people who haven't seen the movie that it to me it's really powerful and effective and evocative of like just the importance of humanity and treating people kindly as well as humans uh, as as well as animals too um but then this movie i felt like was just a disaster i hated it i hated its ending i hated its violence i hated everything it had it was so boring I thought the movie was shot well. That's about all I can say for it. But otherwise, I did not did not like it. So I don't know if your thoughts have changed on it. Like if you feel better. I know you've said before you would sooner watch that than uh, Morbius. <laughs> but I would probably yeah. sooner watch Morbius than Texas Chainsaw. Um, I mean, I guess it's a difference between us as people. Um, <laughs> no, <laughs> I, one thing. I didn't think it was good. And I didn't particularly enjoy it. But I'm surprised yeah. it's your worst of the year. Uh, mostly because... You know, there's like a handful of things about it. I thought, I mean, it's just one, also one of those things where when you, for me, because I have an affinity for the franchise, just seeing old Leatherface again, you know, it's just, I just, yes. it's, it's yeah. kind of, it's the whole, like, as long as I get to see Jason, I'm, I'm happy kind of thing. Um, I thought there was some decent ish perform. There's like a kernel of an interesting idea. We did a whole episode on this, obviously. So, yes. Um, yeah. People can go back and listen to that. But yeah, I it's, it's, for, I find it more frustrating than just purely because like, there's like, the whole time we both were sitting there going like, Oh, I would have done this, this, they could have done this. Here are the types of like social commentary you think they're going to make. And then they end up just kind of not, not doing delving it. it particularly into it. And they go for really easy, low hanging fruit kind of stuff. Not a good movie. I can see why you don't like it. And I wouldn't, I'm not exactly going to kind of sit here and defend it either. Sure. I get um, you. But I am surprised. It's I like, I, I, it, it, it I, I have a hard time believing it's worse than like, the nine of the things you mentioned in this list. So <laughs> the nine. Yeah. All of them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I think I just, I think it sucks. I have. Okay. So I have thought of like rewatching it and seeing if my thoughts would change, but I just, I worry that like, it'll just be too visually viscerally shocking. So like, I, I don't want to, um, but I, you know, if I ever get through the whole franchise again, maybe I'll dive into it, but that'll be when I'm older. So, Did you know Cinematic Doctrine has a blog? Visit cinematicdoctrine.com to read extended thoughts on movies or movie industry news from our contributors. Plus, you can find our podcast on there, too. Uh, And my number one of the year, which came out of nowhere and took me a while to sit on, is Tar from Todd Field. Um, This movie uh, is wickedly good. Um, Amazingly good. And... Yeah, it may not have the spectacle per se of something like Everything Everywhere or RRR or even like the challenging experience of Skinner Marink, which sometimes the top movies from a year are usually ones that really engage me that way. But Tar is so thought provoking and, and fascinating to watch. It is a movie that really, 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 I think, um, uh, I in particular most connect because I'm not sure if we're going to talk about it on the podcast or not. So, but. I'll, and I want to be conscientious of time now, but um, it's just, uh, it really made me meditate a lot on the idea of like how I engage things and what I am in control of. The whole movie is taught like the first interview, inter- there's the movie opens essentially with like a 15 minute interview with Tar, with Lydia Tar. And like somebody asks, like, you know, conductors are sometimes criticized or mocked as like, you don't do anything and like you have no control because the music is what people are playing. And they're like, what do you have control over? And she goes time. And she starts talking about like, she controls the pacing and how it's controlled. And when you control time, you control sound and music and and engagement and stuff like that. Um, And then the movie takes time to show that there is nothing she has control over. Um, and it really challenges like even her own ability for inspiration. Um, there's scenes where 
she's uh, composing and setting up how they're going to 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 play this music. And one particular thing is she has a character stand in another room to play a, a brass instrument. So it sounds from a distance, um, which some people might say is brilliant. But it's something that she only really meditated on because two days prior, there were distant noises that were going on, some horrible, some okay, some annoying. And then she comes in saying, this is how we're going to do it. And so really like as content creators, as people who create, um, it's something where like we celebrate and we make lists like this, where we're like, this is the best thing or whatever. I can't believe they did this, but like nobody ever makes anything out of nothing. Um, God created everything out of nothing and anything we participate in, we are creating under his supervision, control guidance. And, um, this movie really plays with that from from then on outward and it really then puts into perspective some good things that you can do and some very terrible things you can do with that playing field um tar is amazing it is a great film uh i've been hearing about it for a very long time the biggest talking piece seems to always be the cancel culture topic I think that's a very small thing of the movie. And that some people think Lydia Tarr is a real person, apparently. Well, so I'll read you. Um, <laughs> I'll read you the bio. I don't know for if that's this. just a, like a meme or something. But... Well, so the bio is literally the film set in it. This is this is the bio for it. The film set in the international world of classical music centers on Lydia Tarr, widely considered one of the greatest living composer conductors and first ever female chief conductor of a major German orchestra. That literally reads like it's a biopic. Yeah, I uh, I thought it was based on a real thing too until I saw the the jokes about it months ago of like people think this is real and I'm like wait it's not <laughs> like <laughs> it's the yeah, joke it's on me Melvin <laughs> and so and like I I'm totally in defense of people who were like wait it's not real because like that reads like it's supposed to, like the widely considered one of the greatest living composers like how do you write a sentence like that not thinking people will think you're talking about somebody real so. But yeah, Tar is great. I thought this was excellent. Just a beautiful, wonderful, amazing film. Great music, too. Uh, I saw it in theaters. Uh, the music only is diegetic. It's really only when they play stuff, and it's booming, so it's great in theaters. If you want to watch somebody also just like crumble and fall apart, it's a good movie like that, like The Jokers or whatever, all that jazz. But it's, um, yeah, it's stellar. I don't know what else to say. I There's so, there genuinely is so much that can be said about Tar about its characters, about her interactions. But to me, the film is very much playing on the concept of control, humanity's lack of it. And as a Christian, um, understanding the truth of God's sovereignty and our participation in it, um, and how we, um, in our derision of God, sometimes use our gifts for sinful reasons, this movie is really great in that respect super challenging super good super evocative super great all the all the buzzwords i've used this episode for the positive things i'll use them here uh and uh yeah it's uh it's good so that's that's it that's top 10 bottom 10 some notable mentions um 2022 is a good year for movies in my opinion some really great stuff uh and uh yeah best of the year best of the year malignant best of the year again so <laughs> once <we> again <laughs> <laughs> we sit up our hat to yeah. gabriel and malignant thanks so much for checking out this episode of cinematic doctrine if you enjoyed this episode consider leaving a review and subscribing to the podcast and as mentioned before cinematic doctrine has a patreon For as little as $3 a month, you're opted into a once a month movie poll where you decide a movie we discuss on the podcast. There are other unique benefits that come with supporting the podcast, so be sure to check that out at patreon.com forward slash cinematic doctrine. A special shout out to those who support at the Art House Theater tier on Patreon. Thank you so much, Mom, Dad, Melanie, Sherlyon, and Thomas. You guys are the best, and your continued monetary support is greatly appreciated. Until next time, stay cool. Want some Cinematic Doctrine swag? You're in luck! We've got 3-inch Cinematic Doctrine logo stickers exclusive for Patreon supporters. Perfect for your travel mug or laptop. Head over to patreon.com forward slash cinematic doctrine, link in the show notes, and choose the independent theater tier. Doing so will net you other perks too. But let's be real, the podcast stickers are the coolest perk. So get yourself some podcast stickers by supporting on Patreon.